We'd actually shown before that adding back carbs in these lean people can lower LDL. We've even shown it in a case series that the most dramatic response we had was adding about a sweet potato per day, lowered the guy's LDL by 480. Wow. So lowered it by 480. As in it was 665, it dropped to 185 with about a sweet potato. But one sweet potato a day. It was, I mean, a 50 to 100 grams of carbs. So a sweet potato I'm using as a, you know, a comparator of like that carb dose. That was in a case series of five patients. Average drop was over 200. We had a recent um, interventional trial. Also, again, drops. But people aren't talking about these. And that's a shame, not only because I think the science is important, but because there are so many, there are thousands of patients going to their doctors with this response. And if the doctor's first, you know, thought is this must be a genetic disorder, you definitely need medications for this, then somebody could, you know, end up being signed on to, you know, statin therapy or Rapatha or some other medication for life rather than trying an intervention that actually might be more potent with less side effects, eating a sweet potato. Now, if you need it for therapeutic reasons, a ketogenic diet, we have a different discussion. But bottom line is, this is important and needs to be talked about, but it's not being talked about. Can you stay in ketosis if you eat a sweet potato every day? Uh, Or or, or 100 grams of carbs from anything every day? The idea, but not without exogenous ketones. Okay, So so the, you know, we can talk about patients who need it therapeutically, but just the idea that you could reverse this phenotype with carbohydrates, um, which is consistent with our explanatory model, I think is important. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I want to get the word out about the model and the phenotype. That's because I think people should know. I also think that um, we need more resources to do the rigorous research. And I'm not a professor emeritus with millions of dollars in funding, but I can be creative. And I can, you know, stimulate grassroots enthusiasm for this and create pressure um, and interest that hopefully can drive the research forward and get us more resources. So I engineered something that I thought would get some headlines, which was Oreo versus statin. The idea here is if this is a phenomenon that is an adaptive response to carbohydrate restriction, so basically what happens is when your carb stores um, in your liver go down, it kicks off this this fuel trafficking cycle that causes your LDL to go up. We'll right. get into the nitty gritty in a minute. But Steve, th- you have you have a whole uh, PowerPoint with some of the graphics that really illustrate this. Yeah. Well. So yeah. So the, basically, when you're when you're eating carbs, your liver stores glycogen, right? Yeah. So glycogen is the stored form of carbs in your liver. It's used to de, you know you know it. Uh, when your blood glucose starts to go down, you'll release some glucose and it keeps it at a, a steady level. Now, you can obviously create more glucose from things like proteins and um, so it's called gluconeogenesis. But bottom line is mm-hmm. the, the, the cycle here kicks off. And I just want to first give a hat tip to my friend Dave Feldman who came up with a model initially. It's called the lipid energy model. This is a figure one from our paper. We published on it a few years ago. But the idea is your, your carb stores in your liver go down. And when you're, you know, lean and metabolically healthy, you're really good at burning fat. So what happens is fatty acids get released from your fat cells, which you can see here is the little jaggedy lines. And they're circulating around to fuel your tissues, but um, some of them get picked back up by the liver. And then to continue the trafficking process, they get repackaged into a storage form of fat. That storage form of fat is called triglycerides. So you take three little fatty acids and you stick them on a backbone called glycerol and you end up with this molecule that kind of looks like an M. And then to ship them out, because fat doesn't like sitting in water, if you pour like oil and water, you know they don't like to mix. Right. You need to a carrier um, boat, let's call it. And that's called VLDL. So that's the big uh, sphere there that's in orange and green. And the liver ships out these VLDL, mm-hmm. very low density lipoprotein that's carrying the fat. And then the VLDL are going to go to your fat cells, the little yellow cells there, and your muscle cells, where they're going to drop off their cargo. They're going to drop off the fat. So it's going to replenish your fat cells, and it's going to fuel your muscles. So what's happening there is a protein uh, called lipoprotein lipase is kind of sucking the fat out so that they can go back into the fat cells and the muscle. And in this turnover process, where the VLDL is being turned over, the fat's being sucked out, the fat goes down. So fat in your blood is called triglycerides. And I'm going right. to, I'm, okay. I'm highlighting these because these are the terms that are going to define the triad. You'll see right. how it does it. So, <clears throat> you know, there's the VLDL is being shipped out. It's being turned over. The triglycerides are being sucked out, going back to the fat and going to the muscle. So your triglycerides are going down. Right. And then what happens when you take this big VLDL sphere, this boat, and you suck out the core, the triglycerides, the triglyceride goes down, then the sphere shrinks. So when a VLDL shrinks, it becomes an LDL. 
That's what an LDL particle is. So then, you know, because your VLDL is being shipped out so fast and turned over so fast, your triglycerides go down and your LDL goes up. And then the last part of the puzzle is what happens with the HDL? Well, you can imagine if you shrink a sphere, you have to shrink the rim, you have to shrink the surface. And so surface components come off of the VLDL as it's shrinking and get picked up by HDL, and that causes the HDL cholesterol to go up. So you can see through this cycle that your triglycerides will be low because they're being pulled out of the VLDL quickly. Your LDL is high because you're producing a lot of VLDL that's getting turned over really quickly. Mm -hmm. And then as it's turned over, it generates LDL and HDL as well Got from it. the surface component. So then you end up with this triad, three markers, which you can see on a basic lipid panel. Very high LDL, very high HDL, and very low triglycerides. And that is what defines a lean mass hyperresponder. And if you increase you know, trafficking through this cycle by being very, very low carb and lean, then what should happen is this triad gets accentuated, particularly the LDL goes up because you have to traffic more fat around. So that's the gist of it. Um, and, and, and the cool thing about this model, no model explains everything, but models should be useful. So this makes predictions. We can go through some of the predictions, but one prediction, oh, and if you go forward or go backward one slide actually, yeah, so this is the triad that I was explaining. This is what right. results. When you get a basic lipid panel, you see the high HDL, the high LDL, and the low triglycerides. So this is the definition of lean mass hyperresponder. Right. Um, actually, the lean mass hyperresponder doesn't even have a BMI criteria. This is the only definition. The lean mass comes from the idea that this tends to occur in lean people. Got it. So, um, so question, yeah. what happens after the triglycerides are sucked out of the VLDL and then it shoots out regular LDL? What happens with that regular LDL? Eventually, it'll get taken up by the liver or potentially other tissues, which is a whole other topic. But let's say it's taken up by the liver. But VLDL has a much shorter time frame where it's sitting in the bloodstream than LDL. So you end up with um, LDL sitting in the blood for something like three-ish days. Um, and then it gets taken up by the liver eventually. So that's actually a really, really important distinction because if you have a functional lipid metabolism and your LDL is being trafficked really quickly but also taken up, then you have a lot of flux through the system which is different than a condition like familial hypercholesterolemia, which is this, I kind of alluded to it earlier, this terrible genetic condition where you have a broken receptor because then the LDL isn't being taken up. And those are two hugely different by things. By the liver. By the liver. Got it. So those are two hugely different things because it's kind of like, you know, um, water, you know, say there's rain and then there's water flowing down a river and then the levels come up a little bit because it's just rained versus you dam a liver at the other, I mean, a, not a liver, a river, mm -hmm. a river at the other end and then the water levels rise. The water levels can rise for two very different reasons. And understanding those reasons is, you know, it, they have different consequences. The so line. with a lean mass hyper responder, the LDL has a place to go. Yes. And is there a distinction between plaque buildup and cardiovascular disease? Like why, even if it's, if there's more LDL, even though it's getting taken up by the liver, it's still circulating through your arteries and, and your bloodstream, right? So why wouldn't that... Why wouldn't that cause cardiovascular disease in a lean mass hyperresponder? Let's go to the Oreo versus statin thing, okay. and then we'll okay. talk, talk about the risk later. Because when we're talking about mechanism and risk, I do like to separate them just so that they don't get conflated. Like when we're talking about – there's a scientific angle to take on this where I'm like, I just want to understand the mechanism. And then there's the we have a patient. What do we do about it? Mm -hmm. What is the risk? And actually to properly assess that, we need to look in trials for risk, for plaque accumulation, which we're doing. But that's why I want to table that because that's a whole nother study and a whole nother discussion. Which okay. We will have. Okay. I'm looking forward to it. But bottom line, lipid energy model, it's useful because it makes predictions. And one prediction is, you know, if you add back carbs, what'll happen? The driving force goes away, right? Mm-hmm. So should any carb work? I mean, according to our model, it, the model doesn't distinguish. It doesn't say, oh, you need a healthy carb. So should I be able to do this with Skittles or French fries or Oreo cookies? In theory, it should work. In theory, in a lean mass hyperresponder, according to the lipid energy model, if the driving force is depletion of carb stores in the liver, all I should have to do is add back carbs. And again, like I said, we've seen this in other settings, and it should lower my cholesterol. So I decided I was going to test that, but I didn't think that was enough. I wanted to test it with a comparator, and I wanted that comparator to be standard of care therapy. 
in particular statins, which you know most people over 40 listening to this probably will know what a statin is um, if you don't Google it. But it's a common medication for lowering cholesterol. So I thought I'd use a high-dose statin at that, 20 mg resuvastatin specifically. And I did all the appropriate things. I went to the IRB. They gave me exemption because it was an N equals 1 study. My PCP was ordering labs, so she was getting all my labs. They were going straight into my electronic medical record. And I got a lipidologist to consult, an expert, um, Professor William Cromwell, who was consulting on study design and ended up being senior author on the paper. He's been brilliant. Um, really open-minded and really uh, a great mentor in this process. Is he at Harvard? He is not at Harvard. Okay. Um, he's in North Carolina, if I'm correct. Okay. And um, anyway, um, so I came up with a study design, which was I was going to have a run period with my normal diet for two weeks and have blood labs and then do Oreos for about two weeks at 12 cookies per day, 12 cookies chosen because it's 100 grams of carbs. And then I was going to do a washout period, meaning I go back to like a keto diet, let my cholesterol levels excuse me, return to my, their higher, you know, normal status, normal for me, um, and return to my normal body composition because this was an addition. I didn't want to swap out because I don't want to be like, oh, but you reduced fat because you added Oreos. Like, no, I added Oreos. I didn't swap anything out. I didn't reduce my saturated fat intake. Actually, it went up because I'm eating Oreos and they have saturated fat. So you maintained your ketogenic diet that you normally Follow. Yes. In fact, if you go to in the paper um, table one, it goes to, goes through the macro breakdown. And what you'll see in in table one is that my you know uh, Oreo diet was basically just the macro uh, okay. equivalent. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't put it in the slide deck. It would actually be in the actual paper. But um, you, what you'll see if you actually go to the paper, which I encourage people to do, is that for the statin arm and then the run-in, I had the same diet. And the only difference in the Oreo arm is the difference that would be the macros of Oreos. They just get added on. It's Got a pure it. summation. So, okay. um, so I added 12 Oreo cookies to my diet for um, uh, initially I was going to do it for two weeks, then a washout, and then receive a statin for six weeks. People ask why different phases. I mean, sorry, why different durations for the two phases? For statin therapy, just given the kinetics of the drug, um, I was advised by multiple cardiologists and Professor Cromwell that a fair trial of this medication, to give it its you know fair due, fair trial, would be six weeks. So that's why the statin phase was six weeks. The Oreo phase was two weeks because I thought it would be enough time, quite honestly. And also eating a whole sleeve of Oreo cookies in addition to my diet when I have a background of gut issues was... I wasn't going to be able to pull it off for six weeks. Yeah. Um, anyway. So, Why did you choose Oreos, by the way? Why not something else? Can you think of one food that has better branding and just acknowledgement that it is a delicious, hedonic, unhealthy food? Can you think of a better brand? No, probably not. Yeah. Maybe Krispy Kreme. I don't think so. I think no? more people know Oreos than Krispy Kreme. Yeah, you're probably right. Yeah. I saw, That was it. That was the reason. That was like, again... Sweet potatoes aren't going to catch the headline. What is the thing that is the most provocative that if I said this thing, this food lowers cholesterol, yeah. what would that thing be? What shitty food has the best SEO? Yeah, and it's, <laughs> it's Oreo cookies. It's I probably could, Oreos, you're I right. I couldn't think of something better than an Oreo cookie. And you can see the results here on the slide. It was it was um, in 16 days, the Oreo cookies lowered my cholesterol by 71% from 300. That is yeah. astonishing. Oh, it's, it's bananas. Like- it's so if if you want to know, so you see the there are three dots over near the right end of the Oreo yeah, graph. Yeah, you got three tests back to back. Right, because originally it was going to be two weeks, but then on the the two week mark, the drop was so low that we're like, wait, is this really ha-? like I I'm pretty sure it was real, but it was like we just need to repeat it. We need to confirm it. So there's let me get no a test way. Tomorrow. There's yeah, this must be. So let me get a test tomorrow, and then the next day it was even lower. And the next day, it was even lower. So it was actually downtrending still at the end. It might have gone lower if I continued. But at that point, we had confirmed the effect. So in 16 days, 12 Oreo cookies per day lowered my cholesterol 71% from 384 to 111. And that's the LDL. That's crazy. No drug does that. Not even so like Repatha, PCSK9 inhibitor. which Right, can, right. That's what know, Peter Atia talks about. That can reach steady state in you know like five days. And that maybe has a 50% effect. This is stronger than any drug I know. Oh my God. It was cookies. It was so it's like you see this headline and everybody's like, this must be a joke. It's clickbait, but it's legit bait. I this happened. Mm. And even if you just say it's one patient case, yeah, but it's a patient case that was predicted by our model. And that's consistent with all the other literature we have on this topic. So take that as you will. Now, let's compare it to statin therapy. 
satin therapy at a at I I wanted to make it look as strong as it could, so I chose the lowest point, which actually wasn't the end point. I'll tell you why in a minute. But it dropped it to two eighty four. So the reduction for the the statin was thirty two point five percent. So you started when you started the statin therapy, your LDL was at four twenty one, and, then and the dropped, lowest point it got was two eighty four. It was two eighty four. So the 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 relative effect was half as much as the Oreo cookies, and wow. about three times as as long the six weeks. Why do you think it went back up towards the end, the last oh, two weeks? Here's so. If you actually look very carefully, what you'll see is that weeks three, four, and five, it's very stable. It's mm. in the 280s and 290s. It's within like three or 4% of each other. So consider that stable. So say it took me three weeks to get kind of to a steady state. And my initial plan was to go all six weeks and keep everything as consistent as I could. But when you have stable levels for three weeks, it actually presents, okay, I'm at steady state. We kind of have the result. Let's test one more, do a subtest of lipid energy model, which was, all right, one prediction is adding back carbs should lower um, LDL. We've demonstrated that, and we've demonstrated that Oreo cookies are more effective than statin therapy in this crossover. Um, another prediction of the lipid energy model is if this is an energy trafficking system, if you're keto, which I was on the statin phase, what should happen if you need more energy? If you if your my LDL is going up because it's trying to traffic fat fuel and then I need to traffic more fat fuel, should my LDL go up or down? Up, right? It should go up. How do you increase energy? I just exercise. Okay. So what I decided to do is I'm just going to add 10,000 walking steps per day. So let's see what happens to my cholesterol if I just walk a little bit more. And in a week, my LDL jumped by about 50. Wow. That was the blip at the end. So that is Pretty cool. That's a little like again. That's that's an Easter egg in there where that you know really an observant person looks and they're like, "Wait, why is it going up later?" And I'm like, "Because I walked more." No way. So again, a prediction of a model that you can test and just you know uh, on the on the axes, it looks like a small increase. That's just because the Oreo effect is so gargantuan. Mm. But if you see a fifty, if you went to your doctor and in one week your LDL went up fifty, they'd flip the, they just flip. Mm -hmm. um, I'm by just to... walking yeah because I needed more energy so there was more energy flux I okay. mean that's the, the explain that that was the the basis of the prediction and then we executed okay. on it and other people have done this isn't just me other people have done similar things it's just other people haven't published on it because mm -hmm. people are doing this in this like kind of citizen scientist ecosystem right so there's actually a, now a sub experiment there testing another postulate lipid energy model so the punchline here is yeah, I could lower my LDL with 12 Oreo cookies per day by twice as much as I could with a statin over a longer period of time. Mm. Which, you know, that that's something that everybody just, I hope everybody can stop and think about how bizarre this is. And I'll be very clear in case it's not obvious. I'm not recommending Oreos as a health food. I would hope the average American adult or average adult in the globe, you know, has the common knowledge to figure out that's not the case. And I've made this joke before, so I'll lean into it. You know, if somebody's actually tricked into believing by this that Oreos are a health food, then you can thank me for helping out natural selection. <laughs> but um, that aside, I don't know if that joke would get me in trouble. I think it's kind of fair game. No, it's kind of it's tame. <laughs> <laughs>